Well, we're back in the Blessed Life series this, this week. Thank you for the week of vacation I had. Uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, but next week, my uncle Roger, Roger Krynock, he'll be here to share with you. My father, Pastor Tom, and I will be heading off to uh, Ohio. We'll be gone next week sharing about the ministries and vision here at EC Grace. And I'm excited about that. And who would have ever thought that uh, I'd be able to preach at Pastor Keith's church, but what a blessing. Following that, we're going to be doing a mini-series based on the Christmas uh, program we have called The Light of Bethlehem. We'll be doing that for two weeks. And then as we go into the new year in 2020, we'll resume the Blessed Life series as now that we're done with the Beatitudes, we will be getting into the message of the Sermon on the Mount. But allow me to start this morning by taking you back to the Mount of Transfiguration, where God the Father gave to Peter, James, and John three words of counsel. And these three words of counsel, every true believer should take to heart. Matthew 17, 1 through 5. After six days, Jesus took him with Peter, took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter was going to have to say something in that moment, right? While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. You could spend a fortune in therapy, a fortune in counseling, and people do, and never find better counsel than these three words anywhere. Listen to him. Listen to Jesus Christ. In John 6, 66 through 68, when many of our Lord's superficial followers, those who wanted to follow him were following him, they walked away from him because they would not accept his message. Jesus turned to his 12 apostles, his disciples, and he asked this critical question. You do not want to go away also, do you? To which Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Where else is there better to go than to listen to the words of Jesus? His words are not the mere words of man. They're the true Living words of God. Amen. They are the words that lead to eternal life with him. The blessed life here and the blessed life in eternity to come. So this morning, as we return to our series on the blessed life from our Lord's Sermon on the Mount, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to go to the conclusion of the message. We're going to go to the end of the message, his sermon where Jesus calls upon us to listen to him. This isn't the end of the series, we're just going to the end of the message today. Matthew 7, 24 through 29, let's hear the words of the Lord. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came up, and the winds blew and slammed against the house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. So this parable, as I said, this parable is our Lord's conclusion and application 
to his entire message of the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, he says, everyone who hears these words of mine are those words that began where we started in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. Where in Matthew 5, 2, it says, he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, there's his words, he opened his mouth, he started his words, blessed are the poor in spirit. And he concludes here in chapter 7 with this parable. So it may seem a little strange to go to the end of a message and look at it, to look at our Lord's conclusion to a sermon, before we look at the contents of it, which we're going to do in the upcoming weeks. But I'm doing this to prepare us and to show us how important it is to hear and listen carefully to what Jesus says throughout the Sermon on the Mount so that we can apply those words to our lives. For how we respond to his words is a life or death, heaven and hell issue. All right? So we're going to start here, and then we'll go back. Today we will challenge ourselves to look at our lives, to look at how we live. That's what we're going to do. Who here looked at themselves in the mirror this morning? Just a few of you? Did you look at yourself in the mirror? How many of you know what your hairdo looks like? Yeah? Could you say, hey, this is how I wear my hair. This is how I comb my hair. This is how my hair is styled. Do you know in your mind what your hairdo looks like? Hmm? Most of us looked at our hair today, combed our hair, put product in our hair, and made sure our do looked like it was supposed to. All of those except me and those who look like, look like me. We just get up. I know what it is. I got a hairdo. <laughs> but just as you would look in the mirror and intimately know your hairdo, today we're going to look at our spiritual hairdos. Your spiritual hairdo. Do you act on the words of Jesus? Do you hear Jesus, but do you do what he says? One day, Jesus will look and judge your hearing. He sure will. Lord, I pray this morning as we come together to worship you, that you'll be honored and glorified. Lord, may we hear your words today. May we look at them and take real heed. Lord, we want to please you. We love you. We thank you for loving us first. Lord, may we please you in every way. In your name we pray. Amen. So this parable here of the two builders, it's not difficult to understand. And in fact, as we look at it and say, that makes perfectly good sense. One man, what's he do? He wisely builds his house on a solid foundation of bedrock. All right? The parallel passage to this parable is found in Luke 6, 48, where it says, He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. Okay? What we know during that time in the limestone country like Galilee, one had to dig down deep to reach bedrock if they wanted to lay a solid foundation for their home. Luke 6, 48 calls it a well-built home. Do they want a well-built house? How many of you like Alaska? I dig Alaska. I want to go to Alaska. I'd love to go to Alaska. And I watch all the Alaska shows. Sometimes I think I have a survival expertise just by all the survival shows I watch on Alaska. But you know how it is. Knowing and doing are two different things. This Alaska in the show, Building Off the Grid, have you ever heard of that show, Building Off the Grid? 
Well, this Alaska do-it-yourself, he started digging the footers and said, here's the reason we go so deep with this extreme climate. If I don't dig past the permafrost to get to bedrock, eventually this home would shift. Eventually it would cause major damage and it would collapse on itself. I said, wow. You see, with a solid foundation that's founded on the rock in Matthew 7, 25, the wise builder's house withstood the storms of rain, of flood, and wind that Jesus said slammed against it. On the other hand, we see in the same parable, the foolish builder built his house on what only? The sand. He obviously thought that his house though not founded on any rock, would be able to weather any storm. However, to him, when the storms and the rain, the flood and wind slammed against his house, it says in Matthew 7, 27, his house fell and great was its fall. Not just a little fall. Great was its fall. Luke 6, 49 says this, it collapsed and the ruin of that house was great. What's this remind you of in our modern day? Can you think of those multi-million dollar homes in California being washed away in mudslides due to heavy rains, or those homes built on the beach? We see this all the time. Sitting in shock, this man Jesus describes, I imagine in the ruin and the collapse of his house, he no doubt realized how foolish he was to think his house built on sand could ever withstand and stand strong. Maybe now he's sitting in those ruins. He wished that he had listened to others who warned him not to build there, not to build on that sand. Maybe now, sitting in those ruins, he wished he had done what was right. Or that he followed the example of his neighbor who built upon the rock. Both of these homes can be built in the same neighborhood. They can be built on the same property, on the same real estate. They just both built differently. At any rate, it's too late now. All is lost for him. Well, there you have it. That's the parable. We ready to be done? (laughs) But what is the spiritual lesson of the parable? What does Jesus want to drive home to his listeners? He has a very specific reason for this parable. Jesus now is summing up all he had just stated to them in chapters 5, 6, and 7. You see, context is everything. Who is he speaking to is very important. Keep in mind the audience that he has around him. These are the Jews at the time of Christ, and they believed what? That they would all automatically be in the kingdom of heaven. This is that kingdom spoken of over and over in the Old Testament of the God of heaven in Daniel 2.44, the Messiah who would usher in his kingdom upon his arrival. And being a Jew, they were all members of it. They simply believed that because they were Jews, because they were people of the Old Covenant, because they were descendants of Abraham, they were part of the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 3, 9. So right from the start of the Beatitudes, remember what Jesus started to do? He started telling them that to be part of the kingdom of heaven had more to do than with DNA. He starts listing the qualities of a true citizen of the kingdom and the Beatitudes. In fact, his audience was the Jew. But Jesus also knew that very shortly, within a few years, this same message would apply to the church. It would apply to you. It would apply to me. And just as a reminder for us at this time, they were living under the teaching of the Pharisees whose religion was righteousness that was simply external, internally a sham. 
They were out, outwardly, they appeared righteous to men, but inwardly were full of hypocrisy in Matthew 23, 28. Jesus said in the very same sermon in Matthew 5, 20, For I say to you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Those are strong words, are they not? They come straight from Jesus Christ. The righteousness we know of the true kingdom citizen, the true disciple of Jesus, would have to exceed just outward righteousness only. One of the qualities we remember of the true believer was the sixth beatitude. Blessed are the pure in heart. The pure in heart. The Sermon on the Mount tells us how true believers live, think, and act. Whether they were a Jew looking for the prophesied kingdom of heaven or the Christian today in the church looking to go to heaven, it's the same. It is a lifestyle radically different from the ways the world lives. But we know, based on the word, based on the Lord, if pursued, it will result in a genuinely blessed and happy life. And the church standing out like a city on the hill, the blessed life, it will radically transform you and change you. The Sermon on the Mount then describes those who are truly in the kingdom. And by contrast, it also describes those who are not and who will never, ever enter the kingdom. Wow. So is this important? This is extremely important. It's a matter of life and death. Ultimately, that is the only question one must answer. Because when our lives, as brief as they are on this earth, in relation to eternity are over, you either spiritually live or you spiritually die. One of the two. So, in this parable, Jesus is not talking about houses people live in. He is talking about the lives people live. He's talking about the lives people live. The lives they are building in hope of eternal life. See, the house is you. The house is your life. The house is your hope and expectation about going to heaven. Do we have a great expectation of going to heaven? And is that something we yearn for? So what is it based upon? What is the foundation for your belief that you're a kingdom citizen, that I'm a kingdom a kingdom citizen? What is this foundation I have? Jesus says that the only foundation that will withstand the storms of this life, but ultimately the storms of God's final judgment, is a life built on hearing, listening to him, and then doing what he says. That is building on the rock. That is what it is. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 24-25. Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them. And acts on them. He is the wise man who has built all of his hope for life eternal on me, the solid foundation of a faith that works and a faith that lives a transformed life. This message, therefore, is key to authentic Christianity, authentic salvation. So many professing believers today make professions, professions of faith and trust in those professions alone with no action that comes from a transformed life. That is the message we saw in James, remember? In James 1, 22 through 23, where Jesus' half-brother said, But prove yourselves doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. 
remember that word. For if everyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. To be only a hearer of the word and not a doer and to think that you have a saving faith that will take you to heaven, notice, is to delude yourself. To delude yourself. You are self-deceived. Such a person is the foolish builder in Matthew 7. Listen again to the Lord. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them, will be like a man who built his house on the sand. In Luke 6, 48-49, I want you to hear what he says here. But the one who has heard and not acted accordingly is like a man who built his house on the ground without any foundation. Without any foundation. Here's the key to it. The foolish man's house is not just built on sand. His life, his house, His hope of eternal life is without foundation. Without any foundation. He has no foundation to support his profession. No foundation to support his belief that he is in the kingdom. There's no foundation for his claim. We're told in 2 Peter 1, 10 through 11, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Imagine that day when you go home to glory and you receive a rich welcome. Amen? Are we looking for that? So what we see is from God's perspective... His calling and his choosing of the believer is certain. Amen? We do not call ourselves into salvation. But you can, we're going to see, take a moment and look at yourself and make the assurance of your election sure by looking at your life, comparing it to what you say and profess that you are chosen. It's not our profession of faith that assures us of our calling. It is our progression in the faith that assures us of our calling. That's sanctification, right? 2 Peter 1.8 The one who claims to be born again, but whose continued conduct and continued character shouts otherwise, is deceiving himself and heading for judgment. And Jesus is giving warning. The Apostle Paul warned of self-deception in this matter numerous times. He says in Ephesians 5, 5 through 6, let no one deceive you. He then lists the reasons, for they have no inheritance in the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Do not be deceived. Will not inherit the kingdom. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. I forewarn you, those who practice those things will not inherit the kingdom. We see this throughout the message of the Sermon on the Mount. Those who are in the kingdom of heaven. And all throughout the word we see who will not inherit it. You know, when you go through the New Testament, you will find more about authentic Christianity compared to false Christianity if you just take the time to read it. Jesus cares that we're authentic. John tells us, well, we see here, Paul, what's the key word there? Practice. John tells us this in 1 John 3, 7 through 9, 2, 29. He says, little children, make sure no one deceives you. Here we go again. The one who, has, the one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. 
The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin, because he, his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. That cannot sin, we can get into that. That is about an ongoing sinful lifestyle. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who also practices righteousness is born of him. Wow, this is a lot, right? All Christians sin and stumble at times. In fact, all Christians sin and stumble regularly. We all live with our sin natures. But here's the key. Genuine believers mourn over their sin. Genuine believers repent and seek forgiveness. We see this right up front in the second beatitude of those who are blessed over those who mourn. That mourning is over sin. The genuine believer, they continue to hunger and thirst to live more righteously before others in the Lord. You see... Take hope and encouragement in this. It's not that we are perfect, but because of our love for Christ, we desire to be perfect. Amen? This conduct and character are not mutually exclusive of one another. When Jesus started the Sermon on the Mount, he went right to the heart. He went right to the heart. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who are pure in heart. The heart and the conduct work in tandem with one another, not exclusively apart. That's what comprises your hairdo. Demonstrating that they are building their lives on the rock by hearing and obeying. However, the people who claim to be Christians but habitually and unrepentantly continue in known sin, notice the key words I'm using, and they still think they are Christians who will enter the kingdom according to the word of God are deceiving themselves. What does this mean? There are those who have fake faith. Fake faith. Just because someone walked an aisle, made a profession of faith in Jesus many years ago, obeyed in baptism, goes to church, listens to sermons about Jesus and the gospel, and even agrees with the tenets of the faith, does not mean they are saved and going to heaven. You can be full of religion and full of mechanical orthodoxy without a life-changing, saving relationship with Jesus, and that is what the key is. We know that as we draw closer and closer to the end days, men will have a form of godliness denying its power in 2 Timothy 3.5. As Paul describes the last day's professing church in 2 Timothy, it will be religion without morality, form without power, faith without works. The visible church will be characterized in those last days by moral corruption, spiritual deception, doctrinal defection in her last days, in the last days. But praise the Lord. The true church, which is the pillar and foundation of the truth, will stand unshaken upon the rock, Jesus Christ, in which it built its life. Amen? Praise God for that. But I want you to please recognize something in this text. Both builders in our Lord's parable here hear the words of Jesus. In Matthew 7, 26, this word hearing 
and does not act, those are present participles. So what does that mean? You see, the foolish man means keeps on hearing and keeps on not obeying. We're not talking about hearing the gospel and refusing it for the first time. We're talking about a life of thinking you're one of his and not be. If you still may be questioning whether Jesus is speaking about the true believer and the professing believer, Luke records something. He records a question Jesus gave before he gave the parable. In Luke 6, 46-49, Jesus comes in with this question. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? These are people who call the Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say. He then says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He's talking about those who are his. He is like the man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when the flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been built well, well built. But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly, we've already read it. Great is the fall. Both builders here call Jesus Lord in verse 46. Let's go back now to Matthew in the preceding verses of Matthew 7, 24. The preceding verses that bring on the therefore. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons? And in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock, and yet it did not fall, and so forth. Those who heard my words but did not act on them, great is their fall. Do you see the context? The fact is, only the wise builder who acts on what Jesus says and does what Jesus says is in the kingdom. In other words, when our profession of faith in Jesus as Savior is matched by a life where Jesus is Lord. Get that. Jesus, I profess as Savior. My life shows that he is Lord. You are building your house on the rock. Our life and hope of eternal life, of being truly in the kingdom, is on solid ground. Praise the Lord. I used to shy away from messages like these. Hearing them was heavy. One of the greatest temptations for a pastor who needs to preach and teach God's word is to shy away from the messages that may offend. Shy away from the messages that may drive people away. Oh, what if a new visitor heard this? Oh, wow, this is so heavy. This is so hard. In fact, very few churches today will even speak of the false professing believer in the church. But the fact is these messages are some of the greatest messages of love. This is the love of Jesus speaking here. What, why did he came, come? He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He desires that all men live the blessed life that comes with hearing, believing, transformation, obeying him. He doesn't want you to perish. He wants you to live. He died on the cross for our sins. He says, I love you. I love you. Hear my warning. In his love, he warns us. In Luke 8, 28, he replied, My mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. In Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, he replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. These are the things that we tend to overlook 
as we walk down the road of years and years of Christianity. It is love that issues this wake-up call. It's love that issues it to wake up those who think they are in the kingdom all the while while their lives, their values, and their priorities say something radically different. To continue in such self-deception is only to come to eternal ruin. And Jesus says, stop, listen, don't do that. You see, one day the storm the almighty storm of God's all-knowing holy judgment will reveal each man's foundation. Whether it is on the rock, hearing and obeying, or sand, hearing and not obeying, Jesus will judge the here do. And great and great will be the fall of the one whose life was just a profession. A falling away from the Lord, from heaven, imagine it, for all of eternity in hell. Imagine that Jesus is speaking of one's final destiny is right in line with the context. In verses 13 through 23, there are two ways. One to destruction, one to life. There are two trees, one that bears fruit, and one that does not and is cut down and cast into the fire. There are two professions of Lord. One is received by Jesus, but the other is told, I never knew you, and is told to depart, refused entrance in the kingdom of heaven. It's not that Jesus once knew them and now doesn't. This isn't a message of saved, loss of salvation. What did he say? They weren't saved and then lost. That is heresy. That is false teaching. True salvation is justified. True salvation is permanent. It says Jesus never knew them. I never knew you. You never had a walk with me. You never longed for me. You never wanted to do my will. And therefore you demonstrated in your life and your lack of obedience to him that he never knew you. How tragic, how tragic that day when someone will be before the Lord when all is lost and now it's too late. What a fool I was to have just played at church, to have just played at religion. What a fool I was to have not listened to and taken seriously the words and the warnings of Jesus. I talked about how I felt. I talked about what made me happy and what I think God had to say, but I never followed His Word. Jesus never knew them. How tragic. In 2 Corinthians 13.5, each one of us are to do something. I did this myself this last week. Test yourselves. To see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail the test. The Apostle Paul. How many of you feel this message is heavy by now? But you can't get mad at me. These are the words of God. So this last week, I was talking with my father, and we both examined ourselves. After years of professing to be believers, do you know you can preach in the church, teach in the church, be in the church, everything about the temporal life becomes what you do and what you are, and there may be many pastors who don't know Christ as their Lord and Savior. So I listened to God's Word and examined myself. Test yourself. Examine yourself before it's too late. It's so much easier to examine others. I can tell you right now as pastor, I can examine others. And I think some fit into this box. Maybe some don't. I don't know. Jesus knows. It's easier to examine others. But Paul says, examine yourselves. 
It's first in the Greek sentence for emphasis. Only you and God really knew what your heart is like before God. But where there is genuine life, you will see the evidence of it in your life. You won't live a life perfect. You have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. But you will see evidence of wanting to love and serve the Lord. You are on the rock, if that's you. Praise God. If you are trusting the Lord for your personal Lord and Savior, if you're trying your best by His grace to live in a way that pleases Him and obeys Him, if you are honest and humble before the Lord about your failures and your sins, seeking to forsake them, seeking to pursue righteousness through the Holy Spirit's power, if you're renewing your heart and have a desire to serve Him better, that, my friends, is the work of grace in your heart. You are on the rock. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. Praise the Lord. And that should be something you take great joy in. Blessed are you. You are in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. How is your spiritual hear do you hear the Lord do you want to do what he says how is your foundation does your character and conduct demonstrate that Jesus is Lord in your life that you are hearing him that you're seeking to do from your heart what he wants you to do if so praise God that is transformation grace. But if that is not the case, please get honest with yourself. Either come to Jesus for salvation or come back to Jesus to restore the joy of your salvation. Amen? Listen to the Lord. Let's not be people who deceive ourselves. It is the key to the blessed life. Last night, you know, this message heavy on me, thinking about these things. Shannon will tell you, sometimes I say to her, hey, put in your earplugs because I'm going to listen to music. I don't know. When you have somebody laying a few feet away from you with uh, pods in their ear, you hear that, right? So I was listening to music, and then what I do from time to time when I just can't sleep, I start to write. I haven't done that in a long time, but I did last night. And I want you to hear this poem that I wrote last night at 1 a.m. I share these words with dreaded gloom. I deceive myself to everlasting doom. So listen up, you imposters. You spiritual pretenders, a time is coming when you'll look back in regret and remember. It's late or it's early, only God knew the time. I walked as if I was in control. I lived the life of a fool. The profession I made gave me security for eternity. I lived the part and I acted right, but privately I would never fight. I was a partaker of sinful pleasure. I love to live life my way, but when I came around the fam, I was nothing but sham. I would sin, but I would excuse it. My conscience seared because I never really used it. Mourning over sin I couldn't do because right and wrong don't fit, and holiness and evil don't mix. I lived with sin with no pain because sin was my false gain. Sin took me to where I wanted to be, only to take me where I never wanted to be. It tempted me, wooed me, and killed me. I knew the word well, all the Hebrew and Greek words I could spell, each story I could share, but inside me they landed nowhere. You should have heard me pray. I spoke the language. I knew what to say. Many were blessed by my speech, except the Almighty, who I never allowed to teach. I've heard all the words of the Lord. There's nothing more for me to learn. 
So I now skip my devotion full of worldly motion. I was busy in church and busy in serving, but it became burdensome and somewhat boring. I never shared with the so-called lost that were going to spiritually die. I never shed a tear. And looking back, I now know why. No matter how hard I would try, the dead can't cry. Biblical doctrine was in my mind and not my heart. I might as well worship astrology or Scientology since they are no worse than head knowledge theology. After a while, I kept up the charade. What else could I do? It was the name I had made. As time passed by, this lifestyle from the word became blurred and totally absurd. I would come with the church family, sit and not say a peep. I did my duty, but I found out that church was a good place to sleep. I acted like I cared, but I cared very little to act. I would say, I will pray for you and pray for them. But once I turned around, it was as if I never heard a sound. I never understood the excitement to praise and lift my voice. I would just stand there with a scowl on my face. And yes, that was by choice. I became a member by association, but never realized grace and intercessors were praying for my salvation. Everyone but me realized I might be spiritually dead. And when approached, I would just shake my head. As time went by, I spoke little of God in my life. I started falling farther away, living in trials and strife. I would gather with those saints less frequently and participate in little or none, all the while still thinking I was a citizen of the kingdom. I was such a fool when I thought I was so smart. I acted falsely when I thought I was a part, only to find out I never had a start. The Bible was no choice meal. It never tasted good and was hard to eat. But I sure loved those choice morsels the world dished out. I ate them like tasty treats. I found out too late that the Bible may be old, but I tell you, it's not a dish best served cold. I had fallen to the bottom of a well, thinking I've risen to the top of a mountain. I was knocking at the gates of hell, thinking I was heaven bound. I remember I thought I was reaching up, but only touching the ground. Finding out too late that when I thought I was living right side up, I was living life upside down. I built a life on the wrong foundation, only to find out I had no salvation. I built and built and labored in vain, all in the end to find out to my shame that I heard his words but never believed in his name. I built my life on the sand and will never inherit the land. I was a citizen of the sin-fallen world and an alien and stranger in heaven, for he prepared no place for me in the kingdom. I had no lasting believer qualities with no gratitude. My life didn't resemble any beatitude. For I was my God, and God was not. And this hellfire torment is now my eternal lot. So do what Paul, James, and Jesus say. Examine yourself. Do it today. What you hear and what you do is completely up to you. But what you hear and what you do is evidence of what is true. So if I see you here, I'll know you were just like me. A fool who built no, on no foundation. A horrific case of hearing with no salvation. If you are shamming, faking, or deceiving yourself, ask Jesus for the truth. He'll give you himself. It's late or it's early. Only God knows the time. Act now and not later, or you will pay eternity for the crime. Jesus loves you and warns you. He does not want any to perish. Will you accept him and follow him and become one of his cherished? Will you hear and then do? You'll never hear, depart from me. I never knew you. But rather, as he said, you'll be part of the few. Salvation is free. And by grace it comes to you. It's a gift from the Lord, the rock on which you stand. Unlike the hearer who built his life on the sand. So be wise. 
and love the Lord and never come to this place of strife. For you will ever be happy. You'll live the blessed life. Amen. I can only imagine what it would be like to be apart from Christ. But praise God, in my search and examination, I know the Lord. And I am saved all by His grace. How about you? If you're here today with this message of warning, this heavy message, and you're saying, in my life, there's parts of me that I wonder, then come talk to me. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, listen to his words and act on them. But for those of you who are here today and you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior, praise God, your life is built on what? The rock. And we can be the city on the hill, right? We can shine for Jesus Christ. As we move forward in this season, as we look at what's coming, the light of Bethlehem, This is Jesus Christ, the light of the world, who came into the world to save the world. Praise God, we have him. But praise God for his loving messages when he wants us to stop, step back, and think for a moment. Let's stand and sing, please.